All right, so we're going to preach this morning. We're going to talk about wisdom. Um, when we took over the church four, year, four plus years ago, the Lord told, gave me a very specific mandate. He said, I want a mature church. That's what he said. He said, I want maturity in the house. And so we went after it. We just did what the Lord told us to do, and we lost a lot of people in the process, if I'm being honest. You lose a lot of people anyway when you transition to church and when COVID starts the very first Sunday that you are now the pastors. COVID shuts down, and then uh, our beloved senior leaders left, the founders. You're going to lose some people. Zach told us, you, you won't lose many people because I was here. Uh, I'd, been, I'd been here for nine years, and two years into the church plant, we had been here, and I was doing worship. He's like, oh, you, you, know, you helped create the culture here, and it'll be different. We'll just, you just lose a handful of people. I said, mm, I don't think so. And we lost about, I don't know, 80, 75% over the, the, the couple years. But, and some of it was just natural pruning, and it's good. People just move on. It's, seasons are up. And some of it was people did not like the teaching that we had about calling them higher into maturity and stopping some of their junk. And if you don't like that type of message calling you higher, then go somewhere else. And that's okay. So, t- so today we're going to call you higher by, by um, looking at seven pillars of wisdom. And we want you to be wise. What is that word? Wise as a serpent? Innocent as a dove. Sometimes in the church we're too innocent and we're not wise enough. We're too innocent. We need to be wiser. Um, it is true, especially after watching that debate, boy, how would God give us wisdom, man. Proverbs 4, 4, 5 says this, acquire wisdom, exclamation point, acquire wisdom. Verse 6, 4, 6 says, don't forsake her. I love how Proverbs talks about wisdom in a female sense he as a woman i think that's cool because it's all of a lot of proverbs especially the first few chapters they talk about the adulteress and how don't be lured in by the adulteress she's poisoned she she'll tr- call for you and it counters it with well wait a minute wisdom also calls unto you and proverbs says acquire wisdom <clears throat> <clears throat> Verse 6, do not forsake her and she will guard you. She'll guard you. Love her and she will watch over you. Love wisdom. Desire it. Run after it. Grab it. Verse 7, the beginning of wisdom is this, to acquire wisdom. And what is wisdom at its core? The reverent, holy, righteous fear of the Most High God. Proverbs 9.10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So verse 7 says the beginning of wisdom is acquire wisdom. 9.10, Proverbs says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And so what I believe it's saying is when you acquire wisdom, you acquire the fear of the Lord. Or when you have the fear of the Lord, you have wisdom. The foundation of the house of wisdom is the fear of God. Wisdom cannot be established without this. You have to fear God. Um, We wrote this down. We reject at this church. Listen to me. This is a statement for you. This is what we are making a declarative statement in this church. We reject any theology that says as new covenant believers, we do not have to fear the Lord. Flat out reject it. I love the end of Proverbs 1, 7, when it says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. If you despise wisdom, you could be despising the fear of the Lord. Having no fear of the Lord means we are recreating God in our own image. 
Setting yourself up against the knowledge of God leads to only one thing, death. Now, Carly's going to talk a little bit about what the fear of the Lord is. It is not this, oh, my goodness, I'm scared. No. The fear of the Lord looks differently. What does it look like? Well, the fear of the Lord is not being scared of him. It's not living in constant trepidation that a lightning bolt is going to strike you anytime you set your foot wrong, right? That's not who our father is. That's actually a description of Zeus. Yep. Okay? That's not our heavenly father. No. Um, Fear of the Lord is holy, reverent. It's an awe-filled trust that God is who he says he is and that he loves you and that he has good plans for you. Then erected on that foundation are these seven points or themes that we want to talk about. And that foundation of fear of the Lord, trusting that he is who he says he is, are what uphold wisdom. James 1.5 says, if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask God. And Proverbs 9.10 says that the starting point for acquiring wisdom is to be consumed with awe as you worship Yahweh. To receive revelation of the Holy One, you must come to the one who has living understanding. When the reality of God's true nature has caused us to fall down in worship, then we're in the right position to gain wisdom. And wisdom is seeing life from God's perspective and responding accordingly. Not reacting. Not looking at the circumstances that are right here in front of us and freaking out. But seeing life from God's perspective and then responding to that. Proverbs 9.1 says that wisdom has built her house. She has carved out her seven pillars, and she calls to those who lack judgment. Come in here. There is room in wisdom's house to accommodate all, in every translation of every language, all means all, all who wish to live there. No one is shut out from the invitation to come, and I love how it says this, mingle with godly wisdom. So wisdom is a choice. It's not something that's dropped in our lap the day we get saved, or when you hit the 10-year mark, you get a check in the box, and then you get wisdom. No, wisdom is searched out. It's sought after. It is attached to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And you do not attain any of it unless he is the one that you're seeking. But it's not limited. It's available for all who wish to mingle with godly wisdom. Now, the fruits of wisdom we read about in James 3. It says in verse 17, But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. So if you have someone speaking into your life and it's nuggets of things that don't line up with the fruit of wisdom that are listed here, just smile and nod and be about your father's business. Amen? Okay, so we're going to talk about these seven pillars or seven themes that we see throughout Proverbs. I want to hit on the fear of the Lord real quick, too, so that there's no misunderstanding of what we're saying. Because I have, oh, we're going to crisscross. Look at this. We didn't practice this crisscrossing. Um, I do have, I do know people in ministry who who would disagree with me on this, and that's fine, and we, uh, I love them. But, so let me just, let me just break it down for you a little bit so you understand what I'm saying. God has not given us a spirit of fear. Perfect love casts out all fear. So we know that there is a spirit of fear that comes upon you. The fear of God is a condition of the heart. This is why when there's a lack of the holy, reverent fear of God... You see it in certain ministries or churches 
where literally anything can go. You ever been in a service like that? You're like, oh my gosh. Or I've been around a person who Jesus is their homeboy, but he's not their king. And there is literally no reverence for the word of God and for, for what God has put out as a standard to live as a believer. If there's no fear of God, not again, not like in this, oh my gosh, God's going to crush me. God is not Zeus sitting on a throne waiting for you to mess up so he can strike you. This is not God. God is actually looking, actually looking for reasons to continue to bless you. He's like, how can I bless my son or my daughter? How can I continue to pour out more favor upon their lives? But when we lack a fear of God in our house, we literally can do whatever we want. Man, when God walks in a room, there's been times in worship where you feel the presence of God and you're like, oh my gosh. It's not time to just clown around. Oh, hey, homeboys in the room. Hey, Jesus, high five. I mean, I'm sure there's, I'm sure he does that too at times. You know what I mean? So that's okay. And he's your friend. And he, when I talk to him, I talk to Jesus like, like my buddy I do. And, and I talk to the Father like that too. But, but I, there is, I know that I know that he is God and I am not. Do you know what I mean? Like, you're, you're God. I am not. We're hanging out. But at any moment, you can turn this conversation into a moment of teaching and a moment of, like, life. Hey, son, stop. And so I want you to get this. We must be a people that lives with an understanding that the fear of God is actually an unbelievably incredible thing. And let me tell you something. The fear of God doesn't draw you away from him. It actually draws you close to his heart. And when God says, no, and you're like, oh, he's saying no because he loves you. So I wanted to make that clear. Yeah. Anyway. Seven pillars or themes that we see out through Proverbs. So there are different, there are so many different uh, things in Proverbs. Um, and we get the seven pillars from uh, Proverbs. Did you read it? It's, uh, yeah, Proverbs 9.1. It talks about seven pillars. But then, then in chapter 9, it does not list them out for you. It's just like all of us. We're like, where are, the, where are the seven pillars? And there's just, I mean, we did some, we read some commentary. There's people have all different opinions on what the seven pillars are. Um, so it doesn't really, uh, it doesn't really list it, um, but here's what, what we came, we got out of it. Like, so seven pillars or themes, and the first one is integrity. Moral wholeness, honesty, and purity. Proverbs 4, 25 through 27 says this. Set your gaze on the path before you with fixed purpose, looking straight ahead, ignoring life's distractions. Watch where you are going. Stick to the path of truth, and the road will be smooth before you. 10.9 in Proverbs. The one who walks in integrity will experience a fearless confidence in life. But the one who is devious will eventually be exposed. Proverbs 11.3. Integrity will lead you to success but treachery will destroy your dreams. Proverbs 12, 22, Live in the truth and keep your promises, and the Lord will keep delighting in you, but he detests a liar. Integrity is a big deal. And it starts in the little things. Let's get practical. Cheating on your taxes. Oops. Withholding a little information here or there. Oops. That's called lack of integrity. And as a believer, as a son or daughter of God, we're supposed to walk in integrity. Now, there's no condemnation here, but if this is something you struggle with, just stop struggling with it and just walk in integrity. It's actually pretty easy to just to turn in this, just to turn, just like, God, I need integrity. I want to be like you. I want to walk in righteousness. Impurity. Here's another thing. If you say you're going to be somewhere, be there. 
Be someone who your friends can count on because you've proven yourself integrous to your word over the years. My wife and I have a strong, strong core value of if you say you're going to do it, do it. If you say you're going to be somewhere at noon, be there at noon. My mom says, I think we're the most, like if we say we're going to be there at 5, it's not 4.59, it's not 5.01, right? It's 5 o'clock. Now, there's grace, of course. If you're late, running late, whatever, you just text. It's just a matter of, now I'm giving you practical stuff. Text your friend, I'm running late. That's it. Oh, there's grace. Okay, you're running late. Great. Right? But don't be this person, like the Bible says, let your yes be your yes. So again, there's grace in this, and I'm just talking about small little things. Small little things. That's all I'm talking about. But integrity also is a heart condition. Be integrous. Integrity is what you, also what you do in secret that nobody sees. Are you integrous? Are you integrous in the private time? Right? Do you have integrity? So, um, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah. My son graduated, bless him. Um, he's running cameras. He was, he, was, he was running the roaming camera during worship, but now he's sitting back there. Look at him. He deserves a hand clap, everybody. <laughs> he's not amused. I can see his face. He's not amused. He turned 18. So one of the reasons we went to Italia is because um, we said a couple years ago, hey, when you graduate, Josh, you get to choose a trip wherever you want to go, anywhere in the world. Um, and we're going to do it for all our kids. We've already started. Now Gwen's a junior, and we're doing it for her, too. Um, and so, unfortunately for Josh, Josh, we kind of said we're going to Italy. But, then he, but he liked it. He was like, yeah, Italy sounds good. So he graduated high He turned 18, graduated high school, and literally a couple days later, we went to Italy. Now when we come back, and he got his driver's license. Now when we come back, now he's driving. He's taking our van, her van, everywhere. It's like he used to be always want. He used to always want to stay home playing video games. Now he's where is he? He's gone somewhere. <laughs> so we're teaching. We're, in, we're, in, we're I'm going to use you, Josh. It's okay. Um, we we're now like giving him like times. I know you're 18, but you still live in my house. And you have my rules, but there's more freedom, and we're teaching him freedom with boundaries. Which, is by, by the way, is the Christian life. Freedom with boundaries. Um, anyway, so can I share? So he's like, yes. So twice he's been just a few minutes late. It's, it's fine. So last, last night I'm like, hey, listen, if we say this time, you got to be this time or we need to know. We need to know. And so... It was miscommunication, but it's just a matter. It's like the, we're teaching our kids. It's the small things. If you don't do the small things correctly, then when you get to the big things, you'll be like, you won't do those right as well. So, but my son is very integrous. I've told you stories about him before and his purity. And so, anyway, I'm just giving you a small example. Trying to be practical. Okay. Uh, number two. Number two. Number two is humility. Humility is wisely refusing to trust our claims about what is right and wrong. Mm. Leaving those determinations entirely to God. Proverbs 3, 5 through 7, we all know this one, says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your paths straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. And Proverbs 11.2 says, When you act with presumption, convince that you're right. Don't be surprised if you fall flat on your face. But humility leads to wisdom. And Proverbs 22.4 says, The wages, is that a phrase we all know from the New Testament? We all know that the wages of sin are what? Death. Death. Well, in Proverbs, it says the wages of humility are riches, honor, and life. And humility, like all of these points, is a choice. Mm -hmm. It's something that you can choose to pick up. It's something you can choose to lay down. It's not something that um, anybody imposes on you. 
It's something you, it's a it's a heart condition, and it's something that you do to posture your heart to live from a place of humility. Someone said recently, I, I heard them, uh, a preacher say, I need, I lost some volume there, yeah, um, that um, emotions come and go, and they kind of, emotions, you know, they can just come on you, and you can't really dictate emotions, but you can you can how you respond to them. So all of a sudden you might get this emotion and you're like, where did this come from? But you can respond correctly. And humility is one of those things. I can respond to you in humility as opposed to reacting out of this emotion. And that's a big thing. And in marriage, it's also big. Husband, humble yourselves, man. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and to your wife, because you always screw up, husbands. <laughs> always we mess up constantly. And so it's right, we gotta come to you. I think it works both ways. Humbly. <laughs> Number three, sexual purity. Yep. Proverbs six, twenty-four through thirty-three. And I'm not sure uh, what where is this NASB? Because there's a word in there that looks like the message or something. Yes, the message. So the message has some. Here's what the message says. Truth will protect you from immorality and from the promiscuity of another man's wife. Truth will. Prostitutes reduce a man to poverty and the adulteress steals your soul. <laughs> Don't be so stupid. As to, that's why I think it was the message. <laughs> Don't be so stupid as to think you can get away with adultery. You'll discover with humiliation, shame, and disgrace. And you'll see what that's all about. It says, the cost, even those who know about God will have to endure earthly consequences of their actions. Okay, is that a verse or is that just your notes? Oh, 7, through 23. Even those who know about God will have to endure earthly consequences of their actions. Now, I'm going to preface this again with there's grace and mercy. If those have, have had committed adultery and you've walked through that, praise God for the mercy of God. But for those of you who haven't walked through that, don't. Commit yourselves to your wife. This is, this is talking to men. This is scripture. I mean, women also have affairs, but this is talking to the men. Because men, again, we are just stupid. And we just wag our little tongue at the adulteress. This also goes for those who are single. Be pure sexually. Guard your mind. What you Again, practically, be careful what you watch, what you listen to. What you, who you hang out with. We'll talk about that in a minute. And if you're dating, be very careful. I mean, I'll just, I'm all just say, like, don't be alone with your, what else, not spouse, but your boyfriend or girlfriend. You know, don't put yourself in situations that are just dumb. Again, there's grace and mercy. People make mistakes. I get it. But, but try to, um, Put up practical things in your life, guards, guardrails to help you. Man, God, because God, and God will help you. Holy Spirit will help you. He will help you. So um, men, especially, careful what you take in, what you consume with your eyes, with your ears. And um, look at your potential spouse as, as, as God's daughter and treat her as such. Yeah? Good? I don't need to say much more about that. Um, I will say this, though. I believe in, um, I know people, my, people mock this stuff, but I actually believe in uh, this a spiritual virginity. I believe that there is, uh, because here's the deal. If God, if the blood of Jesus is, is thick enough, then he can completely cleanse you of sexual impurity. He can. And there are some strange stories about um, Chris Valentin. You can look it up. Chris Valentin has stories about how the Lord healed the virgin to be physically a virgin again. Look it up. It's creative miracles. 
So that's all I'm going to say about that. All right. Number four, surround yourself with godly friends. This is a huge deal in our house, too. And we tell our kids, man, you, you got to be careful who you hang out with. Right? It's that old, that old saying I heard growing up for years, show me your friends, I'll show you your future. That thing that we heard as a kid for every youth conference, every, every, every youth evangelist, show me your friends, boy, I'll show you your future. I never really understood it, but I thought it was really interesting. Who you, who you surround yourself with, after a while, you become like. You just do. And so it's important to surround yourself with godly friends. Proverbs 1.9. Their insight will bring you success. This is godly friends. Adoring, adorning you with grace-filled thoughts. Also, godly friends can give you godly counsel. As iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens the character of another. I've said this before. Um, your closest friends should not be uh, unsaved, I believe. Uh, you can have unsaved friends, for sure. In fact, we probably should. Um, but they shouldn't be your, in your inner circle. They shouldn't. Because they will, as, as friends do, they, you know, you talk late night, there's conversations, there's people give counsel where, idi you know, idiots give counsel to idiots, and it's just like this mess. <laughs> And it's true, like the blind leading the blind. Oh, that's okay. I did the same thing, and let's do this. Oh, ah, you know, I divorced my wife, too. Yeah, it's fine. That's whatever, right? So be careful who you receive counsel from. Get godly counsel from godly friends. My closest inner circle friends are men of God who have proven themselves over the years to be men of integrity and high character and purity. And those are the trusted few. And you only have a few. I don't have, I don't have 10 of those. I have like three, and those are the trusted inner circle, and I trust them with my life. And any one of those three can say, hey, Chris, I think you're slipping into some deception. And I'll say, whoa, get behind me, Satan. No, I won't. I'll say, whoa, <laughs> accuser. No, I won't do that. I'll be like, oh, man, okay. So that's very important. Please, yeah. And parents, encourage this. In your kids. Yeah. Encourage it in your kids. Yes. We had an incident over the course of the last six months or so with Josh and some people. Oh, we're talking about Josh again. Josh gets some I money know. after this, He's I think. He's going to get lots of money today. Wayne used to pay his kids. A quarter. A quarter every yeah. time he mentioned them in a sermon. So, you know, inflation, we got it. I mean, even a quarter it. in 1980 wasn't much. <laughs> Anyway, we had an incident uh, with Josh with some of his friends where, where a couple of them who he hadn't seen or talked to for months kind of circled back around and wanted to be in his life. Oh, are you going to tell this story? Oh, No, I'm not, not a lot of detail. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, anyway, he, he with, I mean, he knew what we thought, but he on his own drew a line in the sand and said, nope, I don't want to be associated with you. I don't like the choices that you make. I don't like how you spend your time. And I do not need that influence in my life. Yeah. And, they're, and they're now, and they're in jail now. They're in jail now. That might be a really extreme example, but... <laughs> It's crazy what happened. The choices that they made did not produce fruit in their life. <laughs> Period. And so Man. I'm very proud of my son that he he said, "Nope. Nope, that's not what I need in this." He was life. really sh like <sighs> Oh yeah. To the point where we were like, "Well, if you have unforgiveness against yeah. them, you need to forgive them." I mean, we were like kind of shocked at his the strength at which he drew this line in the sand, but Time That's has good. shown us that the line that he drew was necessary. Dude, these yahoos left our house. <laughs> Carla and I were out in the front talking to them for 45 minutes. She actually recorded it because she didn't trust them. She has a, and they wanted him to come. They wanted him to come play. Uh, these are like 18-year-olds. We didn't come play, Josh. I'm like, no, he doesn't want to play with you. 
And I was like, you know, and I just, I fell into my, you know, I'm, I get older, I'm a little more sensitive, more father-like, whatever, okay, give it a break. So I'm like, hey, listen, you need Jesus, you two. I'm like, you need to come to church. You need prayer. You need, I want to see the best in you. I think we might have prayed for them anyway. You know, that's good. But, but it also, there was a part of me that wanted to slap them silly. But I didn't. I was so good, Lee. It was so good. John, you would have been like, wow, you did it, Chris. Now, let me tell you, by the way, you don't, you don't want to get on her especially with the kids. Moms are like, I mean, I'm like, Carly, have a little grace for these. These are just a couple kids. Anyway, they left our house. They wanted him to come. We said, he's not. In fact, we told him, you're not going with him. And he said, I know I'm not going with him. They left our house. No joke. They committed a crime and they are in jail right now from our house to a crime, a federal crime. They're going to, and it's bad actually. And so be very careful who you hang out with. Number five. Did you have anything else? You had something else? I'm doing too many of these. Number five. Manage your speech. What do we have here? Godly speech, yeah. Manage your speech so it's healthy and life-giving. Proverbs 21, 23. He who guards his mouth and his tongue guards his soul from troubles. That's big. 2210, drive out the scoffer and contention will go out. Even strife and dishonor will cease. Scoffers. 2211, he who loves purity of heart and whose speech is gracious, the king is his friend. Colossians 4, 5, and 6. Let your words always be seasoned with salt, drenched with grace and truth, giving a respectful Answer to anyone who asks you about your faith. Manage your speech. Be godly in your speech. Be careful with your jokes. We know this. I mean, you need a lesson. I'm like, I like to joke with anybody, and you know, you get around friends, and you know, it, it's fine. But be careful, though. Like, because sometimes I found over the years when people have joked with me that joke has actually manifested in their life. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I thought you were kidding. But you weren't kidding. So be careful what you say, because you're creating worlds with your words. And so be careful. And in the same, and in the same respect, don't speak poverty over your life and shame over your life. Man, speak, to, speak what heaven says about you. You know, we gave this, I'm going to give this example for as long as we live, our Italy trip. We had no money, none, none, zero, none. We had no money for Italy. We needed about $13,000. And we said, we want to go. I went, went to the throne and I said, God, we want, to go to, we want to go to Italy on this trip for her cousin's wedding and just for Josh and everything like that. And we had, I was, I literally started looking at plane fares with no money. I started looking at Airbnbs. I said, Carly, we're doing this, but I have no money. I said, here we go. Check this out. Oh, this price. You know, I'm acting like I can just pay for it. And it was weeks and weeks and weeks, and we kept doing this. And we're like, and guess what? We spoke it. We, we partnered with heaven. We released it into the atmosphere, and the, trip was, the whole trip was paid for. I think. So use that as your prophetic word. Use it as your prophetic word. If God orders it, he'll pay for it. So again, don't be sloppy with this. Don't be walking presumption. Hear, hear heaven. And he wants you to have things that you want. But also sometimes, sometimes things that we want are not good for us. And so we hold on to this. I'm going to pray for this. I want this. I want this. I want this. I want this. God, God, God. It's mine. You said it, I could have it. But he's like, I don't want you to have it. And so then you're praying against the will of the Father. So say, God, here's what's on my heart. Here's what I want to do. What do you say? And then when he says yes to this and yes to this and yes, because he's going to say yes to a lot of stuff because he wants you to have abundance. And then those things he says yes to, partner with him. Start moving in that direction. We told someone last week who wanted a career change, I said, move in the direction. I believe God's on it. Just start walking in that way. Walk toward it. All right. Number six. I'm going to go back to number five for just a minute. You can. You can do whatever you want. I humble myself to you. <laughs> And I manage my speech in your presence. Okay. 
Do you ever, as an adult, go through life and hear things that your parents said to you in your growing up years? Like they just all of a sudden pop into your head? Something I remember my mom saying a lot of times was the definition of sarcasm. Do you know oh, what the definition go. of sarcasm means? Satan. It means to cut with a knife. Woo! There are times where sarcasm is appropriate. And I know when you're with your friends. Wait a minute. What? Are there times when it's appropriate? To cut with a knife? To be sarcastic? I want to know that so that I can do that to you. <laughs> well, maybe so, that, there's not. so if I do sarcasm, I'm going to say, is this the appropriate time? Yes. Okay. Okay. You can hold me accountable. I'm going to hold you accountable. <laughs> I know that when we're with our friends, especially good friends, <laughs> sarcasm can flow like nothing else. But all of us need to be aware that when those kinds of words come out of our mouth, what can happen with them, maybe not in the moment, but maybe somebody you say something sarcastic and they take that home and they just keep replaying it over and over and over. Yeah. It's cutting with a knife. And not, it's not, the image of it is not these big long cuts. It's these little tiny nicks that bring just a little bit of blood to the surface. So maybe you don't notice it right away. But be careful that your speech is not consumed from this place of sarcasm, okay? And the other thing I wanna say about managing our speech, Josh, you're just like, we've gotta write you a check, bud. When Josh was in the first grade, he came home from school and we had an email from his teacher and he had told us one thing and his teacher another thing, probably about homework or something. And um, <laughs> parents, you know this, with the first kid, you're like, hard, core, and then you kind of evolve as a parent, and you get to the baby, number four, and maybe we're not as hardcore with her as we were with Josh, but that kid came home from school, and I got out a piece of paper and a pencil, and I made him sit at the kitchen counter table in our apartment, and he had to write this proverb. It says, the Lord detests lying lips, but he loves the truth, and I made him write that as a first grader, like, 50 times. That's harsh. And also, I think he was prohibited from going on the field trip the next week. But yeah. you know what that kid has never struggled with a day in his life since first grade? <laughs> Lying. Well, we don't know. We hope. No, Actually. I know. Actually, I he know. didn't go on that trip. It was He didn't go on the trip, but and we told the teacher, and what I did... Actually, that was my decision. She, she made him write this. I said, oh, well, he's also not going on the trip. Um, I actually, that day, took him. I said, bud, you're not going on the trip, but guess what? I love you, and we're going to go have a fun day. So I actually took him, and we had a fun day instead. So. Anyway, it goes, it goes along yeah, I with know. I am a great dad. managing cool. your speech. <laughs> we got to. Okay. Okay, I'm going to go through the, the next two real quick. Number six is hunger for learning. Do not let the characteristics of unteachable behavior take root in you. Proverbs 1.5 says, let the wise listen and add to their learning and let the discerning get guidance. You have a big decision to make. You have a small decision to make. Circle back to those wise counsel of friends and listen to what they have to say and take guidance from it. Whoever, uh, uh, Proverbs 12.1 says, whoever loves discipline loves knowledge, but he who hates correction is stupid. Sorry, that's it's the, the message. message again, yeah. So brutal. Oh, okay, but, but you get the picture. Whoever loves discipline loves knowledge. When the Lord disciplines you, when I make my first grader write a Proverbs 50 times, he learned from it. When the Lord disciplines us, it's because he loves us. He wants to guide us in a different direction. Proverbs 9, 9, instruct the wise and they will be wiser still. Teach the righteous and they will add to their learning. It's not a knowledge that puffs us up and sets us up against who God is. It's not that kind of knowledge. It's tempered with humility and all the other things we're talking about. But it is this constant awareness that this side of heaven, I'm never going to have it all figured out. 
So Lord, let me be teachable and correctable so that I continue to grow into the person that you've called me to be. Amen? Okay, number seven, finally, be fair and just and diligent at your work. Even if it's not the end game for you, even if you are working in a position at a company that is not your dream job, be fair and just and diligent at your work. Proverbs 10.4 says, lazy hands make for poverty, but diligent hands bring wealth. 13.4 says, a sluggard's appetite is never filled, but the desires of the diligent are fully satisfied. 12 verse 24 says, diligent hands will rule, but laziness ends in forced labor. 21.5 says, the plans of the diligent lead to profit as surely as haste leads to poverty. It's not enough to just have goals. Goals and a poor work ethic will not amount to much. But goals and an honest, strong worth Work ethic can literally accomplish anything. Diligence is not just about working hard, though. It's also about being consistent and persistent. It's about showing up every day and giving your best as unto the Lord. Yes, you work for a company and you have a boss and a supervisor. But way above those things is King Jesus. And that is who you work for every day. And you do everything as unto the Lord. Even when we don't feel like it. (laughs) It's about staying focused on our goals and not giving up, even when faced with challenges and setbacks. When we are diligent, we are not only creating wealth for ourselves, but we're also blessing others. And by working hard and achieving success, we can provide not only for our families, but for those in need, and we can make a positive impact on all the circles that we touch. Amen? Amen. That's good. That's the seven that we that we the seven themes that we saw. Um, I'll add this too. It's really important for men, especially uh, provide for your family. We said it, I think last week, or a couple weeks ago, um, one who doesn't provide for his family is worse than an infidel or an unbeliever. So it's important. Uh, and um, if you're looking for a job, you don't have a job, and um, go serve in the house of the Lord. Go volunteer. Go. Find somebody that needs some work done and volunteer time, and usually you'll get some money for it. But just go as a, hey God, I'm 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 I don't have work right now, but I'm going to serve your people, and I'm telling you, you'll get a job pretty quickly. Uh, so that's good. Hey, we're going to um, play a video. We're going to end. You can come up now, uh, and then as soon as the video is done, you can just roll. I don't know what key it's in. There's some music going on, and I don't know if this is even going to work, but um, oh, it'll work. Okay. I literally just threw it on them like right before we came up here. Um, this is this is actually the it's like a five or six minute clip of our my buddy Russell Johnson, and it was funny because I, we saw this last night, and I said, man, it's kind of a real similar theme. He's more focused on the fear of God um, and how the church. Anyway, I'll let you uh, I'll let you see it and digest it, but. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm with him on this. That's why we're playing it. I mean, I've never done this before. Played an Instagram video. Um, but, I, and I know the man. He's a man of character and integrity. He loves the Lord. He's a, he's a weird guy like me. He's very peculiar like me. So it's interesting, uh, our conversations. But um, um, I want to move, I want to move in with this next move of God. And I believe it's, it's going back to holiness. Not holiness that looks like legalism. Not holiness that's rules and regulations, but holiness that captures the heart of the Father. Be holy because I am holy. So make sure the volume's on. Let's see if this'll let's see if this will work. Go ahead. So I say let the fear of God return to churches all across this nation. And in doing so, as a net result, let the glory of God like a cloud rest upon our sanctuaries. And let God release the harvest in unprecedented numbers. But let us not stand idly by or give somehow silent consent to the great depravity that we face in pulpits across this nation. I am telling you, friend, without judgment in my heart, without trying to cast a stone at anybody else, fully aware of the logs that we all have in our own eyes. It is time.
time for the bride of Christ to be made pure again by the refiner's fire. We need the holiness of God. We need the reverence of God. We need the awe of God. Jesus is not your boyfriend. He's not just your partner in time of need. He's not just some sort of casual deity that we get to appeal to whenever we're having a rough day. He is the king and the commander of the galaxies. At his voice, the very planets hang in place. When he spoke lightness in the dark, there wasn't an argument. It just happened. And this God now dwells by his spirit inside of people like me and people like you and it is the greatest privilege we have on this side of eternity so let us function as ambassadors living epistles read by all men who faithfully represent the character of the king that we serve look i may not know what all the answers are to the problems we face in churches across our nation today but i know where the answer begins the fear of the lord is the essential ingredient for wisdom in your life and strategy in your soul i think we need the reverential fear of the lord back in our churches we need the awesomeness of god back in our minds we need the awe and wonder of who he is to reverberate in the chambers of our very hearts this god who is more awesome than we could ever imagine has invited us in the right relationship with him i don't want to be scared of him i don't have to wonder what his opinion of me is i just have to draw near so that what i present to him he can redeem and he can make it holy so that we can be the type of church that this region needs that that god paid such a high price for Come on, do you agree with that? Come on, stand to your feet. God, take us back. Take us back in Jesus' name. The reverential fear of the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. So if you want to come and pray at the front, and our altar team will come up. Come on up, uh, ministry team. If you want to just come and pray and, and just get, just say, God, I just need some time alone with you. I want you to just come to the altars. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. You're calling your church back to purity. You're calling your church back to holiness. You're calling your people into right relationship with you. This is not about rules and regulations and legalism and pharisaical thoughts. This is about relationship. This is about life. This is about hope. This is about abundance. This is a heart condition. And Father, we turn our hearts to you in this time and we want to be this church encounter church of vegas wants to be part of the next great move of god that is happening on the earth that is happening right now we want to be part of that lord we want to usher in your kingdom and so father we bow our hearts before you we say king jesus you are king you are lord you are savior you are god in jesus name